Masahiro Sakurai, one of the most well-known names in the entire industry, largely for giving us Smash. This guy just knows the industry inside and out. He's played so many games, and so when you trust your character to Sakurai, you know you're going to get a loving depiction. Even the swim animation will be loving. Is your swim animation loving, Parappa? No! Despite not taking a break from Smash since 2014, Uh, 7.246575 years ago. He is more than this series. It's absolutely his life's work that's culminated in what we have here in Ultimate, but Sakurai is far more than the director of Smash. You'll be familiar with some of his other works, but others may surprise you. Also, he's immortal. Here he is at age 23 in 1993, and here he was last year at 51 years old. Sakurai is one of those people that makes me feel incredibly unaccomplished. As you may know, he's the creator of Kirby, but did you know he was 19 years old when he made him? This little whippersnapper drew a circle and everyone cheered, and they're still cheering today! The rest of the development team couldn't quite draw Sakurai's Kirby, so they called this design Sakurai Kirby, while everyone else's drawing would use Kirby's old name of Twinkle Popo, so this was Awata Twinkle, and this was <laughs> Suga Twinkle. Good lord. Prior to Sakurai and Kirby, How weren't doing badly, but they didn't quite have their hit moment. Adventures of Lolo was great, but was disrespected by the masses. They also did a Ghostbusters game, and Satoru Iwata would help tighten their relationship with Nintendo by lending his talent to games like Balloon Fight and Mark Rider, but How themselves didn't quite have a flagship franchise. Iwata was taking pictures from the How team for a brand new idea, and then in came 19-year-old Sakurai who said, Leave it at me, baby. Sakurai not only made the Kirby character and conceived the idea, but he directed the game. By the time it shipped in 1992, he was 22. Imagine doing that at 22. Itty bitty Sakurai had already hit the big time, and his debut project would go on to sell over 5 million copies worldwide. Which incidentally, the Kirby series has never topped today, at least as of this recording. And it's seen that Halle decided that Kirby was their focus from here on in, and a sequel was in the works for the following year already. Despite being the creator of Kirby, there actually aren't that many Kirby games for us to talk about. He mostly just set the groundwork, refined it, and moved on. But let's take a little look at Kirby's Dreamland. Yeah, this is what we got in the West, whereas they knew he was pink in Japan. Our localizers looked at the game and said, Yep, that's right, ship it! Incidentally, that's how games are made today too. Though Miyamoto did want him to be yellow, which is partially why there's a yellow and white alt in Smash. Neat. When you think about Kirby nowadays, you probably think copy abilities. It pretty much is his major identity, and most twists on the gimmick still have him transforming into different things. But Dreamland hadn't got there yet. This was a Kirby game about sucking and blowing and nothing else. You just suck and blow. And you know, there's a raw elegance to this. In most other games, you ignore what's around you and just slash your way through everything, but here, every obstacle is the answer to overcoming it. There's a lot more platformer DNA without some of the brawler elements that came in later, and in that regard, nothing's really missing. It leans into its limitations and delivers one of the most iconic games on the Game Boy. And given Kirby originated on the Game Boy, it doesn't have some of those funky quirks of other series. Like, Mario doesn't quite jump right in either Mario Land 1 or Mario Land 2, but here, Kirby's Kirby. This is what Kirby was always meant to be like. There's a certain polish and attention to detail you expect from Sakurai, and that's right here in his first game. It's not a long game at all, my recording came in at 20 minutes, but there's so much quality packed in here. Each level's got these cute little intro animations, like look at him go. You, you can't get that fish out Kirby. There's more character here than pretty much anyone else on Game Boy, and the dance at the end of each level is slightly different depending on the world. Each world's got a different dance. Mario could never. And though you can't take their powers, you've still got most of the iconic enemies of the series with their abilities. And all the music and theming is exactly what Kirby leans on today. You'll also notice a ton from Smash. The spicy curry, for example, that's this right here. King DDD as well. His recovery is here. His forward A, his hammer. They basically nailed most of what Kirby was on their first try. It's also just really cool seeing Sakurai respecting the past so early. Adventures of Lolo lives on. Respect them! Although it's a very short and fairly easy game, I'd still rank this as one of my favorite Kirby's. There's so many ideas packed into this thing, and they even gave it a new game plus and... 
If you ever complain the Kirby series is too easy, play this on New Game Plus. It's a nightmare. I fear this. But then, a year later in the West, we finally found out what color this guy was in Kirby's Adventure for the NES. And this... This truly perfected what Kirby was. Right down to the final boss being a horror beyond my comprehension. All those abilities from the first game, like Waddle Doo's Beam and Sir Kibble's Cut, can now be taken and used by Kirby. He doesn't get different appearances like in later games, but this was the NES, and the ambition of giving Kirby 25 different copy abilities was already mad. Kirby can also run by double tapping forward, much like Smash. The seeds are being sown. Adventure's a much longer game than its predecessor. Getting 20 minutes into this is barely scratching the surface. Instead of just five levels, there's now seven main worlds, each with separate levels in them. There's also mini-games, more secrets, and just a ton more experimentation. Though the Super Nintendo had been out for two years, and being a late NES game, this game might just be a bit too cool for the NES to handle. And yeah, if a game doesn't perform well, it's not technically flawed, it's too cool for the console. It's flawless in the 3DS 3D Classics version though, so you should get that before you can. Adventure gives us even more iconic Kirby pillars that we know today. More iconic music, most of the iconic power-ups, and even flippin' Meta Knight! Meta Knight is a man of honor who will not fight you until you pick up the sword. This is how I duel people too. Pick up your sword, viewer. Outside of performance, this really hasn't aged a day. I mean, maybe copy abilities can make things a bit easy sometimes, but whether you use them is up to you. I actually prefer most bosses without them. They're also, for sure, not all equal. Wheel's awesome for traveling quickly across the rain, and the sword doesn't slow you down at all, and Spark gets a ton of coverage, but I mean, this one, this one makes you sleep. Actually, no, this is the best one. As far as iterations go, this is absolutely one of the biggest. There have been so few Kirby games after that don't feature copy abilities, and even those ones still tend to transform Kirby into something. Both Dreamland and Adventure have gone down as some of Kirby's very best, and some of the best games on their respective consoles. And with that, we're actually coming towards the end of Sakurai's Kirby career. Kirby Superstar, or Fun Pack as it's known here in Europe, is Sakurai's final, completely original Kirby platformer. And given Dreamland 2 was made entirely without his input, it's safe to say he was already eyeing up moving on from the franchise, but the damn Super Nintendo was too luscious to ignore. Although he ignored it for a while, the N64 was three months from launching. Fun Pack describes the game really well, as it's less of a completely new standard Kirby, and more of a collection of smaller, experimental ideas. There are new mechanics that carry over to most games, like being able to form partners out of enemies, and then kiss them. There's major new additions and refinements to the formula too, like hats for different abilities. You can kiss them while wearing different outfits. This is the dream! You can also perform different moves with different inputs. It's a pretty drastic change. And again, it's pretty much like Smash. There's actually quite a bit of early Smash DNA in here. The guard button debuted in Superstar 2. For something I just described as a compilation of smaller games, Superstar does a ton to continue bringing Kirby forward, and honestly, between this and Star Allies, not a whole lot's really changed. I mean, each game has its own gimmick, like, big suck, but Kirby's core movement was modernized and barely touched again since this game. Superstar's got nine games in total, but with four of them being mini-games, you're mostly looking at five short platformers. This game's about as long as Kirby's Adventure, it's just more spread out. Spring Breeze is a rad little remake of the original Kirby's Dreamland, only this time with color, copy abilities, and heavy patting. Just what the Game Boy was missing. It's not a complete remake though. Some parts are missing, including a complete world with the Shmup boss, one of my favorite bosses. This was rectified in Superstar Ultra for the DS, but it wasn't a Sakurai game, so we don't acknowledge it in this video. The other games are totally new though. There's a little one with four stages that culminate in a boss against a giant bird, but when you kill them you realize that they are babies, and now, now you've got responsibility. Are you happy, Kirby? And there's a game where Kirby defends Dreamland from Meta Knight by invading and destroying the Halberd. This one rocks. There's times where you fall off and you've got to do like a forest level, but then you find your way back up to the Halberd, and you go through the engine room and the wings, and it, it's awesome, it's great. There's even some story with crew members talking the entire time, like, Kirby's too dumb to do this, oh no, he's destroyed everything. I think this is my favorite one. And then there's stuff like the Great Cave Offensive, everyone's favorite smash level. This one's a bit less traditional, the aim's just kind of to escape the cave, but there's also a bunch of puzzles to find treasures. It's all right. It's clear why this is such a highly regarded game. 
It brought Kirby forward in so many ways while being packed with variety. It's not one single game, but it was a big step for Kirby. And a lot of this found its way into Smash 2. Kirby's new cutter combo became the recovery, cooking was his final smash in Brawl, and of course, the Halberd and Great Cave Offensive. It's an important game, and the legacy lives on not only in Smash, but the rest of the Kirby series. Now, the blueprint was complete, and Howard gone to make Kirby games largely without Sakurai. Of course, Dreamland 2, but also Dreamland 3, and Dream Course, and Block Ball! He would lend his voice to King DDD in Kirby 64, but in terms of game design, Sakurai had no involvement at all. The N64 era would lead him and Satoru Iwata to creating Dragon King the Fighting Game, which inevitably became Smash. Smash is a huge commitment, and Nintendo wanted another one instantly. Smash 64 launched in 1999, and Melee came around as soon as 2001, with only 13 months of development. That's impressive, but hardly something to be applauded. It was a grueling cycle, and Sakurai calls that era destructive. But even with Kirby platformers and Smash complete, Sakurai wasn't entirely done with Kirby. He supervised the Kirby anime, Kirby Right Back At Ya, that went live in 2001, and in 2002, he returned to direct the remake of Kirby's Adventure, or at least co-direct, Kirby's Nightmare in Dreamland. This mostly brings the original up to the standards of Kirby Superstar, while giving it a beautiful new facelift. It's less of a directional undertaking for sure, but it's still a rather big project. But the following year, in 2003, was something wildly more ambitious, and his final full-scale work at HAL. Kirby Air Ride Air Ride's one of those games that had a pretty poor reputation when it was new, most critics didn't like it, and most fans didn't like it. But in the modern day, everyone's just decided it's great. I think it's more the majority that didn't like it have just kind of moved on with their lives, whereas those who always loved it can now come out of their burrows and sing its praises with zero consequences. Personally, I enjoy it. I mean, I don't enjoy it that much, but I do enjoy it. It's a rather unconventional racer where the best way to get speed is to stop entirely. Unlike drifting in a game like Mario Kart that keeps your momentum going as you drift, if you want to make a quick turn in Air Ride, you've got to come to a complete stop. You then just kind of reposition yourself and wait for just the right moment to get a boost, and away you go again. This is done with the A button, and so is everything else. Want to stop and turn? A. Want to inhale an enemy? A. Want to use a copy ability? A. It can feel a bit limiting, but there's still a ton of strategy in these limits. The vehicles are all wildly different too. We're not talking freaking Chocobo GP here where it's like, oh, this one's a little bit faster, but the handling's better with this one. No, this is the standard star, and this one can't even turn unless you're drifting. But of course, the mode everyone remembers with Air Ride is the slot car one. If I had a nickel for every time this came up, I, I wouldn't be able to afford Cloud and Chocobo GP. City Trial! You get five minutes in a big old sandbox, and you drive around and pick up as many power-ups as you possibly can. Some will make you faster, some make turning better, some make you heavier, and heck, you can jump off and get an entirely new vehicle, or just roam around in 3D space as Kirby. Once five minutes are up, you take part in a random game. It could be a race, or a little mini-game. You basically don't know what you're powering yourself up for until you're taking part in the minigame. And if that sounds remotely familiar, that's because it's the exact same setup as Smash Run in Smash 3DS. The power-ups even look the same. Air Ride's a fascinating game between Melee and Brawl. Not only are many elements lifted straight from Melee, but you can begin to see crucial ideas that would resurface in later Smash games. For starters, the menus. Even if you didn't know this were a Sakurai game, you could tell from the title screen. The sound's even very similar. Weirdly, the mode select menu looks a lot more like Brawl, whereas the options are more like Melee. You can even pause and move the camera around mid-race, and again, listen to that sound! I think Kirby's model might even be from Melee. Obviously it's just a pink circle, but boy is that a familiar pink circle. And the checklist! This one's fascinating. It's basically an achievement system, and that's awesome because Air Ride predates the Xbox 360, which popularized them. But this idea is surface for Brawl, and the UI is incredibly similar to that found in Kid Icarus Uprising and Smash 3DS and Smash Wii U. There's far more Smash flair in Air Ride than any previous non-Smash Sakurai game. And from here on, all games are like that. Sakurai does have credit for Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, but as of its release in 2004, Sakurai was no longer an employee at HAL. He's merely a special advisor for Amazing Mirror, and had no directional input or major involvement in development. Air Ride was really his last game. 
After Kirby Air Ride, Sakurai had a change of heart on how he perceived the games industry, which led him to leaving HAL. His Wikipedia page claims he was tired of sequels, but that's not really accurate. He was tired of how the industry worked. Because they're constantly analyzing and interacting, the marketers knew more about what gamers wanted than developers. And Sakurai didn't like how developers didn't share the success of a game. Regardless of whether a game sells 20,000 copies or a million copies, you get paid a standard salary. He basically wanted to change how all of this worked, and how was no longer the right fit. It definitely wasn't because of too many sequels. Being a free man, Sakurai would collaborate on two other projects, and one... Mwah! Gah, you fellas! Flippin' Meteos! If you know me, you know I love Tetris Effect, and I also love Luminous, and I also love Rez. I just love Tetsuya Mitsuguchi, the man is a genius. Well, Meteos was a collaboration between Mitsuguchi and Sakurai. That is sex. Meteos is pretty similar to Pound Upon, which is another form of sex. Only instead of shifting blocks horizontally, you drag them across a vertical plane. If you match three, pwah, they launch up in the air. And if you launch them again before they hit the ground, you can either get a combo or clear the blocks. It's a ridiculously good game, easily one of the DS's very best, and gets severely overlooked. There's some surprisingly dark theming here too. Meteo is an evil planet that's trying to destroy all the other planets, so you voyage around space defeating all the meteos by launching blocks until you eventually battle the planet of darkness. I'm simplifying it, there's quite a lot of text, there's probably law wikis on this thing. And as I was saying about Air Ride's menus, does this look familiar? You can even shift them all around with the touchscreen, and that's something that came back again in Kid Icarus Uprising. He may not have directed Meteos, but the Sakurai flair is everywhere. You can totally feel Mitsuguchi too. That's a Mitsuguchi block right there. Meteos would later get a sequel with Meteos Disney Magic. This is real. Sakurai's in the credits, but just for his work on the original game. Seemingly no involvement with this one, but I wonder what he thinks about it. It's not bad, but it's also way worse. Blocks can be moved both vertically and horizontally now, which makes it way easier, and god does it make it less fun too. The menu and UI design is also far more generic, although instead of fighting an evil spirit planet, you now fight Disneyland, which... You know, actually, they didn't change that much. Now Sakurai's next game gets misreported quite a lot. In the same year as Meteos, Sakurai worked on a Mushi King game. And this was on Wikipedia, and I was gonna screenshot it, but it's no longer there anymore. I complained about it on Twitter, so maybe that got rid of it. And if you don't know, Mushi King is a madly popular Sega franchise in Japan, revolving around a rock-paper-scissors system, but with Beatles. It's largely known for the arcade game, which also had collectible cards to give you brand new Beatles to play with. But there's also a Mushi King anime, GBA games, DS games, and a bunch more. It was a big thing in Japan. The arcade game's actually the world record holder for number of tournaments as of 2008. Over 100,000 of them. And this? This is what many think Sakurai was involved with, as many credits just say Mushi King. But no, it wasn't the arcade game, it was actually this little LCD game. It's like Tamagotchi, you raise these little beetles and you take care of them. It, it's a weird Sakurai game. But Sakurai's time away from Nintendo was fairly short-lived, as he was just as surprised as any of us when Nintendo name-dropped Super Smash Bros. Revolution at E3 2005, a brand new Smash game for Wii with online play. Yeah. I am pushing our team to make sure Smash Brothers is one of them. At this point, Sakurai wasn't involved in any capacity, but in a hotel room after the show, Awata asked Sakurai to direct the game. Sakurai agreed, and development began in October of 2005, and only eight months later, we'd see the game ourselves, complete with a brand new art style, final smashes, and solid snake. HAL were no longer the developers, and only supported alongside Monolith Soft, Game Arts, and Sora Limited, Sakurai's new studio. Although the only members of Sora were Sakurai and his wife Muchiko. They needed the manpower of other studios. Brawl was important for numerous reasons, but one big thing it did was revive Kid Icarus. Smash usually pulls very faithfully from a franchise's source material, but with Pit, many liberties were taken, and through character design and general portrayal, Sakurai pretty much made his own Pit. Hell, he even reimagined Palutena and Skyworld. It's clear he had a vision for what Kid Icarus could be, and so maybe not too surprisingly, that's exactly what would happen next. A year after Brawl shipped in 2009, Nintendo announced Project Sora. This was a brand new studio bringing together Sora Limited and Nintendo basically giving Sakurai Nintendo stuff. 
The studio was very short-lived and was brought together for one single game, and this game were to be a launch title for the Nintendo 3DS. In fact, Sakurai was the first person outside of Nintendo to learn of this system. Uprising wouldn't quite hit launch coming a year after, but buddy, perfection takes time. Kid Icarus Uprising is simply one of the best handheld games ever made. One of the best games ever made. The controls won't click for everyone, but if you can get into them, you won't find another Nintendo game with this much going on. The scope, the story, the sheer amount to do, the multiplayer, it's huge! And I'm not talking like a 100 hour single player here. You can beat Uprising's story in like 10 hours, but there's so much in those 10 hours. It's like Sakurai knew there wouldn't be another Kid Icarus game for a very long time, so they packed like three sequels into this thing. The first acts like a nostalgic revival of Pit vs Medusa, but then there's this entirely new villain who dominates their screen time. There's battles against aliens, rollercoaster thrills with twisted Greek mythology, and even some legitimately hard-hitting moments. Control's barely ever taken away from you in Uprising, and so most of the story is happening dynamically as you play, and so parts like this hit very hard. And there's so many moments like it. Hell, there's like two chapters in this game where Palutena no longer guides you, and so another goddess takes over, and when she takes over, the entire menu and UI is themed after her. For two chapters! And then never again! <sighs> That's mad! If you skipped Uprising, slap your wrist, and then apologize to it because you must keep it well rested to play this game, and just play it now. It's as packed as any Smash game. Mountains of weapons, achievements, trophies. There were even collectible AR cards, and I can't find mine, so here's my phone with a picture of one. They can fight each other. And the multiplayer. Oh boy, the multiplayer. I don't fall for online shooters much, like outside of Halo, Splatoon, and a small handful more. I don't get grips, but this thing gripped hard. That's a hard grip you've got there, Uprising. Everyone can customize themselves with stuff they've got from the story, and that may sound unbalanced. I mean, you could just get the strongest weapons with the strongest abilities and dominate, but doing that means your death is worth more points for another player. That's a big deal in the team game Light vs Dark. If one person kills you while you're decked out, well, that might be enough to drain your team's entire life gauge. And if that depletes, then the last person who died spawns is either Pit or Dark Pit. And if you die as them, you lose the game. There's a ton of maps, a ton of variety, it's just incredible. Again, the controls won't land for everyone, but if they work for you, I don't think there are many Nintendo games or video games in general that come close to this one. It's a must play, and possibly Sakurai's greatest accomplishment. Happy 10 years Uprising, only 15 more to go until the next one. And that is the legacy of Masahiro Sakurai. A big chunk of his time has been dedicated to Smash, but between all these games have been others of equal value like Mushi King. Making Kirby was no small feat. I tried drawing Kirby, I don't know what went wrong. But then Meteos and Kid Icarus Uprising, these are masterpieces in their own right. You'll see them as a special thanks in other games too, like Super Meat Boy Forever. It's more admiration than actual credit for their work, not an uncommon thing for credits. So are you telling me he didn't work for Def Jam Fight for New York? Nah, he was the secret director. Don't tell anyone. I usually end these videos on a dumb joke because I don't know how to write. But Smash has given so much to me. It's introduced me to other franchises like Earthbound and Metroid, and it's just broadened my tastes so much that I don't know if I'd be here today doing what I do if it weren't for Smash. And while Smash means so much to me, I think Sakurai's talents can be so much more. And when he gives us games like Uprising, it just shows like this guy's capable of anything. And so I hope Smash takes a bit of a break and Sakurai can just work on anything he wants. I think he can make a banging hentai game.